Okay, so as I said that we would be doing uh, last time, um, I want to start by giving you guys a chance to ask me any questions that you have about um, anything, about homework assignments, about readings, about anything related to the class. Are we going to go over the, the like, not really go over, but like talk about the Seneca assignment? Yeah, we're probably going to spend about half the class doing that. Yeah, so we, we are going to talk about the Seneca. What's that? Will we be going outside? Not today. <laughs> because, it, frankly, it's just too cold for me out there. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, maybe, you know, when, when, the, when the weather warms up a little bit, if it's, an, if it's a pleasant day. Gotcha. Um, and, you know, I, if we're going outside, I have to get, like, a big whiteboard that I can drag outdoors. Mm -hmm. um, so I, there's some advanced prep involved. So if we're going outside, I'll let you guys know in advance. Any other questions? Just give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Just make sure. I don't want to cut people off before they're ready. Okay, um, so just a couple of things I want to say about the first homework assignment, right? So everybody has got, uh, got the grade and read the feedback, right? Okay, it's, it's, if you haven't seen it yet, it's in Georgia. It's all available in Georgia. Um, overall, for a first assignment, uh, you guys actually did a pretty good job. Right? I was actually really pretty pleased with how this last did. But there are a couple of things uh, I noticed um, across the board. Uh, that I just wanted to quickly uh, <clears throat> try to give you a little bit of help with so that you would uh, do better next time, right? So, all right. All right. so first, one thing I noticed a lot of you were doing was you were kind of trying to cover the whole essay, right? It's good to, you know, yeah, you read the whole essay, make sure you understand the whole essay, and that you're dealing with an issue that is in the whole essay. But in terms of where you should focus your attention when you're trying to write about it, start small, right? So one thing you should all have you should all be doing from now on is narrowing your focus. Right. Focus most of your attention on some small part of the essay, you know, like maybe like a single paragraph, right? that you think is uh, you know, really important to the overall meaning of the piece. Um, the other thing um, I do want to make sure uh, happens uh, from now on. Right? Make sure that you are aware of any special instructions that I have given the class, right? So I will always put those up here at the beginning of class, and if you, miss if you miss class, I will tell you about them, right? But make sure that one, you are only doing the assignment that you are supposed to be doing, right? So in this case, right, you're only supposed to do assignment one on page 36, not, the, not any of the others. And also, you know, any instructions as regards to the subject you're supposed to be using and things like that, right? Um, most of you uh, did this, but just there were enough issues in understanding that I wanted uh, to make sure that it was clear. Uh, now, do you guys have any particular questions about the assignment? Just, uh, about just, and, and just any questions you have about the last assignment? About <sighs> I didn't actually get a chance to like look at those videos that you put about okay. the Seneca, but mm -hmm. um, kind of like where where I took it as like he was, you know, he had one position like when he started, but then he ended like not being on either side. Okay, yeah. Uh, so he starts. You, you felt like he starts talking about one thing mm -hmm. and ended up talking about something else. Uh, yeah, that's actually a 
that's actually a really smart way to look at the essay. And we are going to be uh, talking a little bit about that um, in the second half of class. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll cover the essay itself um, in a little bit. So yeah, just sit on that for a minute and we will get back to it. Okay. <laughs> so, yes? Are you going to talk about like why, he, like why he answered his own rhetorical questions? Or? Yeah, we can talk about that. That is something we can discuss. Yes? That was a very, to me at least, it was very scattered in his points. Uh -huh. So would we just, are you like saying we just need to pick one point and stay on that? Yes. Would it just completely leave the rest of what he said out of it or um, include it? But <clears throat> I would say you know, include it if it's relevant to the large, the point you're dealing with, right? So yeah, I would say stick to one point you can mention stuff that is not part of that point, but is relevant to it. But yeah, try to keep your analysis focused on pulling out that one point, right? I think that like, like we have this tendency, right? We want to go global when we read something because we, it, it makes us feel smart to do that, right? It's like, okay, like I feel like I need to understand the whole thing. When oftentimes we will get more out of what we read if we stay local, right? Um, there's a, a classic comparison in philosophy. I think it was first made by Aristotle. Um, he said that you know the fox knows many things, the hedgehog knows one very important thing. So what I want us to try, I mean, what he's talking about is the difference between the generalist and the specialist. But for our purposes, for most of what we're going to be reading, I want all of you to try to be hedgehogs, right? Try to focus on one really important thing in the essay. And if it helps to think of yourself as a hedgehog, then, <laughs> then you know, please do so. OK, uh, so if there are no further questions, um, I'm going to start, as usual, uh, with a quick close reading exercise. So we've got a quote uh, from the American science fiction writer Isaac Asimov that I'm going to put up on the screen here. And I want you to try to do, uh, of course, the eraser is over here. I want you to try to do the following with it. All right, first. Identify key words and phrases. All right, try to pick out as many important meaning bearing words and phrases as you can and think about what their significance might be, right? <coughs> Secondly, I want you to try to organize these keywords into patterns, right? To the strands and binaries. Right, where strands are patterns of repeti repetition, binaries are um, patterns of opposition, right? Um, remember that only one half of a given binary might be stated here. So if there's a word in here that has an opposite, you might want to think about what that opposite is and how it's at play here as well, right? Um, also, remember that when we talk about strands in, ter in terms of repetition, we mean like repetition of ideas and concepts, not just repetition of a specific word, right? Um, then, once you have done that, I want you to think about what the author must also believe if he believes this to be true. Right? What assumptions 
are being made underlying all of this, right? Okay, so you can go ahead and get started. And just take your time, focus on the first two steps here intensely for a little bit, and then we'll break and talk about them. How are we doing here, buddy, guys? We feel like we've at least made some progress on the first two steps here. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with keywords and phrases here. What have you guys picked out? Uh, the word cult. Okay, cult. Like, it's almost like a, like a blind following of them. Okay, yeah, we tend to associate cults with blind obedience. 
and dogmatic behavior, right? Like people who don't toe the line in the cult usually end up shunned, right, by the by the other members. Right. Um, what else? What 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 other connotations does the word cult have? Like, in what context do we tend to use the word cult? Bad. Okay. Yeah, it's got negative connotations, right? We typically don't use the term cult to describe people we like, right? Right. And it also has a religious connotation, right? Yeah, or just a, or like, like any kind of you know small religious group that's outside the mainstream that um, enforces particular codes of behaviors and beliefs, right? So even if we happen to belong to such a group, we usually don't refer to it as a cult ourselves, right? This is a word that outsiders tend to use to describe other people's beliefs, right? Okay, good. What else? I think along with cult, whenever it says the cult of ignorance, uh -huh. and how it's in the United States, I think that was kind of a key phrase. Because okay. I mean, you don't think that the United States would be ignorant. I mean, we do ignorant things. <laughs> but it, you wouldn't think of us as a cult. Okay. Let's roll off of that, like, from the inside looking at, like, just like what you just said, like if it's like an outsider word, you know, like uh -huh. that's him, who I'm guessing is a guy of like, you know, he looked his name, he looks like he's a Russian guy, but he does say our political and cultural life, so it seems yeah. like he is an American, but yeah. so, he yeah. is a Russian guy, so he's probably looking at it from the outside. Like, like, yeah, and yeah, um, Asimov was uh, himself, you know, he, yeah, he was an American science fiction writer, but he was the son, I believe, of Russian Jewish immigrants. Okay, yeah. So yeah, he might be looking at, he might still be looking at American culture at a slight remove, right? right. But yeah, he, he seems to yeah, he seems to include himself in Americanness, right? right? But not in this cult of ignorance. Right. I think that's an important distinction to make, right? So does he seem to think that this cult of ignorance applies to everybody in the United States? No. Yeah, this cult exists, right? There is this a group in the United States for whom this is their dogma, right? But that doesn't apply to everyone. Okay, good. What else? What else have we got out of this? Always been. Okay, all has always been. And can we identify that as part of a strand? Is there another word that's related to that? Constant. Yeah, has always been and constant. And what do these phrases have in common with each other? How do they form a strain? They're always something else. They're the same always. Continuous. Continuous. Mm -hmm. Continuous. Yeah. They, they both refer to time, right? Correct. They're both concerned with time. And they both suggest permanence, right? Right. I feel like, you know, he, he, he says always been, so that's referring to the mm -hmm. past. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a good distinction to make here between the two, right? Yeah, the bin is past tense, and the constant means something that continues into the present. So <laughs> linking past with present. I would like even further with that is thing is that like maybe a sense of acceptance of yeah, is it, yeah, the, yeah, there's a sense here, right, that this is something that either, that, you know, something that has been with us since the beginning, right? right? That's part of our political and cultural life and is thus difficult or impossible to get rid of, right? That, the, yeah, that this particular idea has, has very, very deep roots. Says nurtured by the false notation that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as my knowledge. So mm -hmm. the, I don't know how to word it, but I mean it uh -huh. feels like like y'all said they're used to it. So yeah. it's kind of it's, mm -hmm. instead of being you know slap on hand that's not good, but you just accept it. <laughs> I also think he's like, he's dead. It was a newspaper, no. Yeah, right? <laughs> he's 
it's obviously it's coming from a place of opposition to ignorance. Yeah. Like, I mean, he kind of mm -hmm. comes out the door with that. But, yeah. you know, he's talking about it in some, court, some kind of like social parasite. Like it's a thread winding its way through our political. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, the idea. It's been supported or nurtured by yeah. the false notion. Yeah, the idea of a, this a thread winding its way through our political and cultural life. Yeah, there's a metaphor in there, right? right. That our political and cultural life is like a garment. And one of the threads making up this garment is this wacko belief, right? Right. And what does he blame on this? What, what, what does he blame as the source of this belief? The false notion that democracy means yada yada. Right? Yeah. Notion. So what he's saying, so the false notion, or so if there's a false notion of democracy, what else must there be? Yeah, so there's a true-false binary here, right? right? That is, you know, half of which is left unstated. Mm -hmm. But we can, you know, right? Clearly, he's assuming, right? Right, as we do the work of uncovering assumptions here, that if there is a false notion of democracy, there must be a true one. And then I think we need to work backwards here from what we've got to figure out what he assumes that true notion of democracy would be. So what does this mean? My ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. I mean, not, I'm just kind of shooting the wind here. I feel like it's, you know, like live and let live kind of thing. And you think of democracy, you think it's like, do as you mm -hmm. wish, you know. So okay. It's like, I'm, like I'm allowed to be ignorant if you're allowed to. You know. Okay. So one part of the assumption here, right? So he's saying that people assume that democracy means that all opinions are weighted equally, right? right. So um, let me give you an example here that we can work from. So uh, my wife and I renovated our house uh, last year. Um, now. I know absolutely fuck all about tools, right? I can barely hammer a board into a nail without hurting myself. So do I have any business going up into the attic and telling the carpenter doing the work there how to do his job? Yeah, Me, like, and, and by the same token, right? You know, I have a PhD in English literature. Right, I've been studying literature and language for the bulk of my adult life, um, which is now longer than I like to admit. Um, and you know that same carpenter, while he knows what to do in my attic, right? You know he knows you know how to you know you know how to you know put up the walls and you know put the insulation into them and you know fix beams and things like that. Um, does he have any business coming in here and teaching my class? No. Yeah, because this is outside his area of expertise, right? Now, you will find some people where areas of expertise overlap, right? So, you know, Dr. Waldrop down the hall is also a general contractor. <laughs> so, you know, you know, so, you know, he could come in here and teach my class. I could not do his contracting work for him. Um, but uh, the basic point here, right, is that, um, the idea he's talking about here is that everybody's opinion has equal weight in this notion, this false notion people have of democracy, right? What is he suggesting should be the case? What does he think democracy really means or really needs? Uh, I, it seems like he's someone who like, truly believes in the notion of like, knowledge is power, like, like knowledge is important. Mm -hmm. uh, just to kind of relate on like, the Seneca thing, you know, he was talking uh -huh. about how, uh, like, the pursuit of wisdom was like, all the, so it's like, knowledge is power, basically, is what I'm trying to get in that. It's like he believes mm -hmm. in, to be intellectual is, okay. is a great advantage. And it, sure. And it would bear, a, 
I guess a heavier opinion like people would be more likely to listen to you mm -hmm. somewhere later. Yeah, I, I think that's closer to what he means, right? Yeah. The idea that democracy should respect expertise, right? right. Not be stubborn, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Right, with the opinion of someone who doesn't know anything about a subject should not be weighted as much as the opinion of someone who has put in the work and put in the time and actually studied it, right? So, <clears throat> there's another way I want to try to think about this, right? Um, there is a formulation that the textbook gives us uh, for dealing with um, these kinds of implied ideas in a text that can also help us form thesis statements as we start moving into that phase of the class. So the way they formulate it is, seems to be about X, but could also be about y, right? Where x is the explicit literal meaning, the surface meaning, the obvious meaning, and y is some implicit meaning, right? So what seems to be the main point of this Asimov quote? Let's, let's try to think of it less as being framed like a moral or like advice, yeah. and just in terms of like what the quote actually says, right? So when we think something like a significant subset of American citizens misunderstand what democracy means, So we can say, right, seems to be about X, right, seems to be about American understanding of democracy, misunderstanding of democracy. But there are these other side issues that we've already pulled out of this as well, right? But could also be about blind obedience, the cult thing, right? But could also be about time and permanence, the has always been constant thing, right? could also be about the relative value of expertise. Right. So there are all of these implied values in here that we could pull out and make the subject of a longer paper. And you will find this sort of thing in just about um, any even relatively small quote. Right? You know, this is what, you know, this is two sentences, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, most of the units of analysis we've been working with have been pretty small. And we can do the same thing with any of these things that we've close read over the last couple of sessions. Right? So, you know, the first day we had that Jonathan Swift quote. We had the descriptions of those monkey-like creatures that turn out to be human beings, right? So that piece of text seems to be about uh, parodying um, scientific language but could also be about lack of self-awareness, right? right? Because the scientist character there, Gulliver, does not recognize that he is also one of these creatures. Right. Um, the quote from The Hobbit that we looked at last time, right? It seems to be about the nature of language, you know, that, you know, where Gandalf is questioning Bilbo as to what he means by good morning. But it could also be about the importance of context in determining meaning, right? So there are these other side things that are always implied in any given piece of text that we can use 
to find a way in, right? something else to think about, right? something to pick apart. So when we are coming up with an interpretation of something, there are two seemingly contradictory ideas that we have to be able to keep in our heads simultaneously, right? One, there is no right answer, right? This is not a fill in the bubble test. Um, you know, there is not going to be a single correct answer, especially given that most of the questions you're going to be when you're writing, you're, that are posed when you're writing, you're going to be posing yourself, right? One of the one of the things we're learning to do is we're learning to think and learning to write is simply learning to ask better questions. However, some answers are always going to be better than others. So on the one hand, right, there is no single correct answer, but on the other hand, it's not all, well, everything's relative either, right? It's not all, well, just need everything you want. We have to work with the information that we're given, right? So <clears throat> one sub rule that we'd add to this is that you can't just make shit up. So if I was to say, based solely on this quote, that Asimov's uh, response to anti-intellectualism was based on his personal experience of cult membership in the United States, is that a good interpretation of this? Mm -hmm. no. Why not? He yeah, yeah, I don't know that, right? There's no evidence, yeah, that he has any direct experience with cults, right? So I can't simply add something from outside of this to explain it, right? Now we'll talk about how we can use an interpretive context to pull things out of the narrative, right? Which involves actually using stuff that we do know to find meaning. Um, but yeah, we can't just make things up in order to construct the narrative, right? Because then all we're doing is telling a story. We're not actually analyzing what we're reading. You also want to try to account for as much of the evidence as possible. Right? If you find a strand or a binary, make sure that you are explaining in your response the whole strand, the whole binary, right? The actual logic behind it. Okay, how does this thing work? And right again. I can't stress this enough, right? Only use what's actually there. Finally, make sure that your interpretation is plausible, right? That is, that another person looking at the same evidence might come to the same or similar conclusion. Now that said, right, you know, we don't always have to come to the same conclusions about what we're reading. And a lot of our conclusions are going to be determined by context, right? So when we talk about interpretive contexts, we're talking about a variety of lenses through which we can look at a particular text and get meaning out of it. So, the kinds of contexts we can use to interpret a text are things like 
um, the social context in which we're looking at it. Um, if you are watching a film with your friends, or watching a film for a class, and if you're expecting to write an analytical paper about it, right? Even if it's the same film, are you going to respond in the same ways or pay attention to the same things? No, because everyone sees things differently. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, yeah, you, you may not, uh, well, I think what I'm looking at is kind of the, the way you're responding, right? When you're with your friends, as opposed to when you're doing this for a class, right? Your friends are more like the, the general, that was good. You're not going to really get into detail of what, what yeah, actually really happened. Yeah, right, because you're watching for enjoyment rather than for analysis, yeah, right? right? And you're simply sharing that enjoyment with other people. So you're not going to be focused on the same things you might if you are looking at the film to analyze it for a class, right? Um, historical contexts are a way that we uh, might uh, <clears throat> frame a particular text that we're looking at, right? So we're actually going to be applying some of this uh, to Seneca, right? You know, if we know certain things about ancient Rome and about ancient Roman culture, then there are things in Seneca's essay that might otherwise be confusing that make a lot more sense to us, right? Um, disciplinary contents matter. What are you all majoring in? Nursing. You're nursing, you're bio? Pre-med pre bio? Uh, history with um, a teacher certificate. History and, and marketing. Okay, so you two are probably going to be looking at a lot of things from a similar disciplinary perspective, right? Because the things you're doing are related. Right? You're both you know, primarily concerned with biology and with medicine, right? Um, your disciplines are rather different <laughs> from each other's and from everyone else's here, right? But the discipline you're studying conditions the way you're responding to a particular text, right? right. So if, I'm, you know, if you're reading a medical textbook for a biology class or a nursing class, you're not going to be reading it the same way you might read even the same textbook if you're asked to do so in an English class, right? You're not looking for the same things. So what interpretive contexts do is they condition where you focus your attention. with an academic major, right? Even you know, sort of as a general human being, you belong to a variety of what the literary critic Stanley Fish calls interpretive communities. And you know, far be it from me um, to criticize the great and famous Stanley Fish. Um, you know, I'm just a nobody who teaches at a small state university and he is a famous uh, published dean of humanities in various places. Um, I actually think much of this stuff is bullshit. Uh, but this is a fairly widely accepted idea, right? And pretty useful for thinking about the way we read, right? So an interpretive community is a group that shares interests, Right? A jargon that is a kind of specialized language that everybody within the group understands. And a way of looking at a particular subject. Right? So we've already kind of applied this idea to an academic major, right? If you're majoring in history, then yeah, that conditions the way, you know, historians have a particular way of reading text and interpreting text, right? Literary critics, literary scholars have particular ways of reading and interpreting texts. Um, but, you know, even like something like a fandom is a form of an interpretive community, right? Mm -hmm. um, are, are any of you involved in any like intense fandoms? Like, are there any of you like go on message boards for K-pop groups or things like that? 
not so much. There, you know, aren't any like movies or TV shows or musical acts that I need to be like following really intensely with that? Okay. So yeah. So if you go on like you know Bray's Anatomy message boards and things like that, or join like Bray's Anatomy Facebook groups, things like that, then the people in those groups will have a particular lingo that everybody understands, right? <laughs> You know, they'll refer, they'll use acronyms or new words or specialized phrases, right, that refer to the thing that they love that people who aren't part of the fandom won't get, right? Um, you know, even like if you look at things like um, intense Star Wars fandom, right, you know, there are a lot of abbreviations people use, um, you know, people will have particular ways of interpreting new films that come out um, that are often seemingly conditioned by years spent alone in one's mother's basement, um, <clears throat> you know, raging at the, you know, raging at the fact that anything ever changes, <laughs> and cultivating one's neck beard. <laughs> but I digress. Um, but yeah, like, you know, people will share information in particular ways, will interpret the, te the thing that they love in particular ways. Um, just as, people in academic disciplines will you have a particular focus on the thing that they study, right? So even like within English, say, right? There are a number of different interpretive communities within the discipline, right? So if you were taking a class with the aforementioned Dr. Waldrop, who was also a general contractor, like he's much more interested in like traditional theories of aesthetics and things like that, right? And in um, you know, kind of like the, the great books and great authors of uh, English literary history. If you were to take Britlet II with him, that's what you get. If you were to take Britlet II with me, I'm much more interested in history and economics and in the ways that kind of material culture, material conditions um, generate culture and kind of like, you know, create the ground um, on which art is produced, right? So I'm much more, in, I'm less interested in individual authors and more interested in like broader movements, things like that, right? So we're in the same discipline, but we're coming at it from different angles, right? We're, you know, involved in different interpretive communities in that way, right? So let's try and apply some of this uh, to Seneca. So first off, I guess, let me just ask you guys, like, what did you guys think of Seneca's essay. Try to go for it. Writing in the margins, the first like page, and, uh, the first two pages I was reading it, uh -huh. I was like, damn it, I did not read any of that. So I had to like go back and I was like, okay, I'll just try writing in the margins. Uh -huh. and, then I started writing the margins and actually taking the time to look up words as opposed to skipping over them like I normally yeah. do. It, it forces it you to pay really, closer attention, right? It yeah. made me mm -hmm. understand what he was actually, or at least I thought I understood about that. Okay. So let's just go, go around and whoever's willing to talk, like, you know, what do you feel like you got out of this? What did you get out of Seneca's argument? Well, when I, the passage that I read, that I read uh -huh. he asks a lot of rhetorical questions to mm -hmm. us, but he answers them in a lot of detail. Yeah. And that kind of keeps you, you know, mm -hmm. seeing it in his perspective, but also interpreting, interpreting, I can't, anyways, <laughs> we're on the way. Okay, yeah, he does ask a lot of rhetorical questions, right? And one thing you will often find me writing on the feedback on your essays, if you do that a lot, is stop using rhetorical questions, right? Because usually rhetorical questions are a kind of dodge that we use to bring up an issue, but then avoid really dealing with it. Yeah. But I think that's what was different about it, is like he would mm -hmm. bring it up and make you ask, hmm, I wonder. Yeah. And then he's like, well, here's what I think. Yeah, that's the idea. He wants you to question these particular pieces of received wisdom, right? It's like, well, is this really what we get out of this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess he kind of like answers the rhetorical question. I guess like kind of include the audience into the thinking as well. Yeah. Like, he asks the questions, but then yeah, he gives his response because mm -hmm. I mean it makes you ask like somewhat sure for the questions, and then he responds. Yeah. 
Right. It's a way of encouraging you to think along with it, right? Yeah. And I think one thing we need to remember, so there's a, an issue of audience here, right? Is that he's actually writing to an audience of one. Right? Remember that this is not something that he published and circulated. This is um, a letter to his nephew who had asked him a question about what sorts of things are worth studying, right? So, you know, he, he starts with that first sentence, right? You want to know my attitude toward liberal studies, right? He's responding directly to the question that his nephew would ask him in a letter. I didn't even get that. I thought he was writing the letter to the people who didn't believe in what he believed in. Uh-huh. And it showed them why. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. What, what, so, so that can actually shape the way we think about this, right? Is that this is not a public pronouncement, right? This is private advice to a young person who trusts him as a mentor. Right? It also gives you insight to him and like what he truly believes. Because like it's not like this is being put in the public eye, at least at the time. Mm -hmm. So you know, like this is coming from like his like his actual beliefs and his. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, and you know, it's, it's much more of an intimate piece that way, I think. And yeah, you know, it, it, it's also um, you know, frankly, you know, kind of amazing that we still have you know a letter that survives from year fifty five CE, right? Mm -hmm. Um, what else did you guys think of this? What else did you get out of this? I, I, I thought it was interesting how he uh, kind of compared like being, or, or like having a, the, uh, what was the question in the thing? It said something about like liberal arts, mm -hmm. uh, can make you morally yeah. Another, exactly. Yeah. 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 Right. Whether he thinks they can actually, whether studying the liberal arts can make you good, but it gives you the tools. You it yeah. gives you the tools to do so, even though. But I think that's why he mm -hmm. kind of combats his own, you know, argument there. Is he's like, well, not everyone is going to choose to be more with the tools. It's like, but you mm -hmm. have an opportunity with these tools. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think that the, the argument he's making is actually pretty complicated, right? And it's not a straightforward for or against. Now, if we look at the binary that's set up in the title, right, between liberal and vocational studies, does everybody understand what he means by vocational studies? No, well, I don't. Is he using uh, that as what he meant by the pursuit of wisdom? Well, when I hear the word vocation, I think like a job, or like a, you know, so I think he's thinking liberal is more of like an intellectual than a physical yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, so vocational studies would be like what we would call tech school. Yeah, or like right? a trade of some sort. Yeah, so if I wanted to learn to weld, and I went to tech school for that, right, that would be, I'd be pursuing vocational studies according to Seneca's definition, right? So yeah, so vocational skills are job skills, right? Vocational studies are studies that are designed to teach you to do a particular job. Physically. Yeah. In, in most cases, because that's just mm -hmm. the way I got it, is like in a liberal would be more of like a intellectual way of like doing a job like teaching or like sure. something of that nature. And to give you a sense of how the Romans uh, would have thought about this, right? So, liber in Latin means free. Free as in not a slave. Okay. So, liberal studies would be those studies that are appropriate for a free man. And I use the word man here for a reason. So he talks here a lot about virtue, right? What's virtue? What do you, what do you think virtue is? 
It is a hard word to define, right? We all kind of yeah. think we know what it means. I would say. You know, we have a kind like of general fuzzy sense of what it is, right? Yeah. Like a, I don't know, a set of ideals, or like what you like. Mm -hmm. Like it's something that it's not really an attainable thing. It's more uh -huh. just like what you strive for, like okay, like right. things. Ideals or goals? Yeah. Right. What were you gonna say? I think it's not necessarily something that can be taught as easily as. Uh -huh. Morals or, but like virtues, like yeah. to me, like to be like having like a genuine, like good heart. And okay. Like a natural moral compass. Yeah. Uh huh. Now, Seneca means something more specific by this, okay. in large part because he's a Roman, and he is thus conditioned by certain Roman cultural assumptions, right? So the word beer. In Latin, means man. As in male human, specifically, right? Not as in general, like human like kind. Conduct of. Yeah, vir virtue, yes, is acceptable or exemplary masculine conduct. I feel like we're left out, Maurice. Yeah, well, and the, 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 fa the fact of the matter is, you know, like in ancient Rome, you would have been, right? I mean, what, what, uh, what's, what's your father's name, Rachel? Um, James. James? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, are, do you have any older sisters? Yeah, I have an older sister named Catherine and another one named Suzanne. So you're number three, right? Well, four. I have an older brother named Matthew. But your sister number three? Yes. Okay. So, what's, what's the feminine form of James? And anyway, like essentially, what that means, right, is your your name would be something like uh, uh, like Jamila Tertia, right? So you would be third daughter, which would be like third daughter of James, right? That would be your name. So it would just be based off of the male figure. Would be yeah, would your name would be if yeah if you're a, if you're a Roman woman, your name was the feminine form of your father's name plus whatever number daughter you were. Oh. That's weird. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, weird to us, right? But that's the context they're operating in, right? right? That doesn't mean it's right or good or fair. <laughs> but, you know, this, this is, the, you know, this is the, the, the world in which Seneca operates, right? So, you know, if we're using ancient Rome as an interpretive context, right, then that tells us some things about what he means by virtue and what he means by liberal, right? And that these, the, the meanings that he's using are rather different from what we might mean when we talk about these words. So, in the interest of kind of furthering this idea of historical context as a lens to look at this through, let's talk a little bit about Seneca's specific circumstances, right? So Seneca himself um, is a member of what was called the patrician class. Does anybody know anything about um, ancient Roman history? Do you know what a patrician was? It's not exactly, but I'm assuming it's like a caste system type deal going on here. They have like classes. And yeah. Yeah, there are two. It was like patrician and plebeian, right? Yeah, and uh, those were the two main classes, right? There are other subclasses within the order, but you know, for our purposes, this is um, sufficient. So, a patrician is a member of the aristocracy, right? The patricians are the upper class, and Seneca himself was very close to the imperial family, right? He was, was an advisor to three emperors in fairly rapid succession. And was the tutor of the third of these, em uh, of these emperors, right? So uh, the emperor Nero, um, Seneca wasn't just his advisor when he was an adult and became emperor but was also his teacher when he was a child. 
Now, he was also exiled twice. And forced by Nero to commit suicide when Nero suspected him of plotting against him. So what does this suggest about the political situation that Seneca is operating in? Uh, you, you know, they don't really, I mean, it sounds like that they're not real, kind of like opposition, they're like different ways of thinking. It seems okay. like he was a guy who was you know, kind of always, he said he was an advisor, mm -hmm. but if, I mean, if he thought he was plotting against him, he probably just gave him some advice that he did. Yeah, the, yeah, the, 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 yeah, there is no evidence that Seneca actually had done anything disloyal to him, right. right? But the fact that he's also exiled twice, right, suggests something about the general political situation in Imperial Rome, right? That it's a little unstable, and that, you know, if you are close to the throne, right, then your fate is very closely tied to the whims of whoever's sitting on it, right? right. Now, this is actually relevant in some ways to the philosophical system that Seneca advocates. Right? Seneca is what's called a Stoic. Are any of you familiar with the word Stoic? You know what a Stoic was? It sounds familiar. I've heard it as like an adjective. Yeah, we still it's use the word. We still use the word to describe somebody who bears up well under pressure. Right? You know, somebody who doesn't, you know, who doesn't fall to pieces when everything goes wrong for them. Right? That's only a small part. It's actually the least important part of what Stoicism as a philosophical system was about, right? So the, the most important thing a Stoic believed was to live in harmony with nature, right? That your desires and your lifestyle should take from nature only what you need, right? Yeah, I'm doing a like world civ now. It sounds a lot like okay, like a Confucius or something, you know, like uh, it's, harmonious. It's it's similar to yeah. Confucius talks mostly about living harmoniously with other people. With other people, right? Taoism is more about living in living harmony with nature. Yes, it's right there. it's similar to Taoism in some ways. Okay, yeah. so it's like self before. It's more like worry about self first, you know, like. Yeah, self-regulation is a big part of it. Yeah, self-regulation is, 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 is a big part of this, yes. Um, the highest good for a Stoic is the pursuit of wisdom. We'll talk in a minute about what Seneca seems to mean by wisdom. And that wisdom Actually, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you right now what he means by it. Wisdom consists in understanding human limitations means, right, is that not only should you be regular, like, you should be avoiding excess in all forms, right? Not only should you be regulating your emotions and regulating your feelings, you also need to be regulating your desire for recognition and for worldly goods, right? So one of the first things he says on page 12 is, well, I have no respect what... I have no respect for any study whatsoever if its end is the making of money. Such studies are to me unworthy ones. They involve the putting out of skills to hire and are only of value insofar as they may develop the mind without occupying it for long. Time should be spent on them only so long as one's mental abilities are not up to dealing with higher things. They are our apprenticeship, not our real work. So this is his attitude towards vocational studies, right? Okay. Now some of this is also class-based, 
remember that Seneca himself is a member of the upper classes and is thus not expected to work for his money, right? He's not a slave and he's not a plebeian. So the assumption he's making about people who pursue these lines of education, these lines of study, is what? We can already know we've already noted a class-based assumption, right? Like twice in their time almost. Like they're not doing what's really important, they're just doing what is, you know. Okay. I'm gonna work for different things, I guess. Yeah. I'm gonna quote one line back to you here. Okay. And tell me what you think of right. Time should be spent on them only so long as one's mental abilities are not up to dealing with higher things. What assumption is he making? Saying that if you can't understand higher things, then this is probably better for you. Yeah, that this is for stupid people. Yeah, right? I was like, he's kind of like the superiority over. Yeah. But he's coming from that place as well, so it's like, he's coming well, from the place of like, oh, well, those people. Exactly, yeah. The, the, these aren't what people of his class do, right? So he is kind of looking down on those who work for their money, right? Now, one thing that we have to remember, again, about Seneca and his disdain for wealth is that he had plenty of it. Right. And, you know, even though, you know, yeah, he did, he went through some trying times, you know, exiled twice and eventually, essentially executed, right? Uh, while he was alive, he never, you know, he never lacked for food, right? He never lacked for sustenance. So, if we can say, we can say from our perspective that it's easy for him to say, making money doesn't matter, because he never had to, right? As advisor to the emperor, upper class person, and literary celebrity, um, right? He was set. He was gold. Why liberal studies are so-called is obvious, to continue here, it is because they are the ones considered worthy of a free man. But there is really only one liberal study that deserves the name, because it makes a person free, and that is the pursuit of wisdom. Its high ideals, its steadfastness and spirit, make all other studies puerile and puny in comparison. Do you really think there is anything to be said for the others when you find among the people who profess to teach them quite the most reprehensible and worthless characters you could have as teachers. All right to have studied that sort of thing once, but not to be studying them now. So the evidence he's using for the fact that liberal studies don't necessarily teach virtue is that some of the people who teach them are pretty horrible, right? Right. right that this demonstrates that having attained that education doesn't necessarily in and of itself make you good. Right. Just give you a chance to do good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He eventually sort of gets there, and this is a kind of building block, right? Mm -hmm. That you know you, you can't build virtue on a foundation of nothing. And it's easier to build that foundation with, you know, this kind of knowledge than with, you know, knowing how to hammer a nail into a board, according to Seneca, right? But if we look if we look at the kinds of things he places under the rubric of liberal studies. You're literary studies, music, astrology, not astronomy, astrology, as in the motions of the planets and stars affecting our existence here on Earth, right? You know, because when he, you know, the Romans believed in this, right? The information one gets from these fields of study, he feels does not actually help him become virtuous, right? Does not help you achieve wisdom. And that indeed, much of it is superfluous. So if we look on page 15, um, we just want to focus here for a second. The, the paragraph at the top here, we start there. There is nothing small or cramped about wisdom. It is something calling for a lot of room to move. There are questions to be answered concerning physical as well as human matters, questions about the past and about the future, questions about things eternal and things ephemeral, questions about time itself, 
On this one subject of time, just look how many questions there are. To start with, does it have an existence of its own? Next, does anything exist prior to time, independently of it? Did it begin with the universe, or did it exist even before then on the grounds that there was something in existence before the universe? There are countless questions about the soul alone, where it comes from, what its nature is, when it begins to exist, and how long it is in existence, whether it passes from one place to another, moving house, so to speak, on transfer to successive living creatures, taking on a different form with each, or is no more than once in service and is then released to roam the universe, whether it is a corporeal substance or not, what it will do when it ceases to act through us, how it will employ its freedom once it has escaped its cage here, whether it will forget its past and become conscious of its real nature from the actual moment of its parting from the body and departure for its new home on high. Whatever the field of physical or moral sciences you deal with, you will be given no rest by the mass of things to be learnt or investigated, and to enable matters of this range and scale to find unrestricted hospitality in our minds, everything superfluous must be turned out. Virtue will not bring herself to enter the limited space we offer her. Something of great size requires plenty of room. Let everything else be evicted and your heart completely open to her. So what are the kinds of questions he thinks we should really be concerning ourselves with? What should we actually be spending our time on? That sounded like existential. Yeah, the nature of time, the nature of the soul, right? Yeah, these kind of big ideas, right? Yeah. Yeah, he is talking, yeah, he's thinking very conceptually here, right? Not in terms of the concrete. Um, and what assumption is he making about our minds here? And about the capacities of our minds? Yeah. We look for, like, study the, the thing that we don't have definite answers that we can compare uh -huh. our knowledge and, you know, learn to think more. And what, what does he suggest we do with all of that unhelpful knowledge cluttering up our brains? Push it out. Like, Push it out, right? So, so again, what, what does that suggest he thinks about the human mind? He we have a limited capacity. Yes. And he is we suggesting that we have limited bandwidth. Yeah. We, yeah. we have limited bandwidth, right? And if we are wasting that bandwidth on things that are trivial, then we don't have the space necessary to contemplate these bigger issues, right? So the whole theory of education that he has here has the idea of human limitation baked into it, right? Mm -hmm. That we're only capable of so much. And if we're focusing on this little piddling shit, then we're wasting our potential, right? The paragraph that follows, and then this is where we'll wrap up, because I, I said we could uh, finish up a little bit early. But it's a nice thing, surely, to be familiar with a lot of subjects. Well, in that case, let us retain just as much of them as we need. Would you consider a person open to criticism for putting superfluous objects on the same level as really useful ones by arranging on display in his house a whole array of costly articles but not for cluttering himself up with a lot of superfluous furniture in the way of learning. To want to know more than is sufficient is a form of intemperance, apart from which this kind of obsession with the liberal arts turns people into pedantic, irritating, tactless, self-satisfied bores, not learning what they need simply because they spend their time learning things they will never need. I feel kind of called out here. we <laughs> hope. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so he's following up here the same idea, right? Mm -hmm. That take what you need, right? Take what actually helps you deal with these bigger questions from the liberal arts. And all the rest of the stuff, you know, yeah. Why, yeah, why do you need to know about pitch and harmony, right? Why do you need to understand the motions of the plants when you can't do anything about them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, again, 
he's writing from this point of view, right, this assumption that human beings are limited. And one of the things we need to avoid is excess. So if we had to put this in terms, like in these, seems to be about x, but is really about y terms, right? One thing we could say here is that this seems to be about education, but is really about limitations, right? Right. And you know, that, that's not the only y we could plug in there. But you know, that is you know, one that we can kind of tease out from some of the assumptions that he seems to be making about human capacities and potential. Okay, so does anybody have any questions? I just have a question, but I'm just going to say, I guess we spent those 12 years learning to play those two or three instruments. <laughs> 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 you never know what the soul comes from. I'm going to interview you. Hey, you know, I, I, I didn't give you Seneca to read because I necessarily endorse it. Yeah. <laughs> then we make a stink. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I did.